step outside. A very good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Indigenous Ways Wisdom Circle. Uh, Indigenous Ways acknowledges the traditional caretakers, owners of country throughout Turtle Island and pays respect to the elders past and present. We want to acknowledge the traditional owners and ancestors of these lands we reside on here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Pueblo people, and wherever you are beaming in from to acknowledge the traditional owners, caretakers, and ancestors of the lands that you are, that you can be here today. Thank you. And uh, Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. And we want to thank you for being with us live, either via Zoom or on one of our many social media platforms. If you're watching the recording of this, thank you all. Your time is precious and there is a lot going on. So the fact that you're here with us tonight means everything to us. Uh, so our theme throughout this new series starting January 2021 is thriving and purpose, going from rising and resilience when we started these virtual events on April 1st. This evening, we will be moderating this event with our gorgeous guest, Ivy and Ivy Sanea. Uh, that spell S for Sam, A-H-N-E-Y-A, Sanea, hails from the Hopi and Tiwa lands. She comes from the Tobacco Clan. And Ivy works at the Tucson School for the Deaf and Blind. And we are going to get a little glimpse of what Ivy's world looks like. So... Hello, Ivy. How are you doing this evening? Hi, I'm Ivy. Ivy Sania. This is my name sign. I'm from Palaka, Arizona. I'm on the North Hopi Reservation in the Northern Arizona region. I'm descendant of two tribes, the Hopi and the Tiwa tribe. And the reason that I mention both tribes, Hopi and Tiwa, is to share with you my mother's Tiwa heritage. My mother's account to me is from her mother with the history going back to the 1700s. Starting with the Hopi village at a place called the first Mesa, Walpi Village, which was one of three villages on the first Mesa. The Tiwa Village was also there on the first Mesa. As time went by, the Hopi chief from the Snake Clan had begun to notice The railroad was stealing land and food and murdering people and trying to eliminate tribes. There were three tribes this was happening to. The Navajo, the Apache, and the Paiute. In order to avoid the demise of the three tribes, and the Hopi Snake Clan chief, realizing the number of warriors was small and possibly dwindling, decided they would need the help of powerful warriors. New and powerful warriors So, they gathered a few runners, and the runners went from the Hopi area to as far as 
the New Mexico area and to the Pueblos and that area. They ran many, many miles over the course of several days, if not weeks. As they also ran back to report to the chief that after several searches, they still had not found warriors powerful enough. The search for warriors was repeated again and again. Then, finally, on the fourth search, they were able to find four warriors from four clans. They were 1. The Tobacco Clan 2. The Corn Clan 3. The Sun Clan 4. The Bear Clan They were all Tiwa from the New Mexico area. They had decided that they were willing to help. Also, after helping, they decided to stay and not return to their homelands. This way, they could continue to defend the community and ensure their safety and growth. The Hopi Snake Chief welcomed the warriors to stay. This is how I derived my mixed Tiwa and Hopi heritage. Now understand that there are different narrations of this story depending on the individual and or region and if they are Tiwa or Hopi. I've told you the exact story, yet there could still be variants. And I am more Tiwa than I am Hopi, but I still represent both tribes. The Tobacco Clan is a Tiwa clan, and I am proud of being so. My full name is Ivy Sania. And my middle name is Sydney, spelled C Y D N E Y. My mother came up with my name after my great grandparents. One, my great grandfather, he was Sydney, S I D N E Y. And my great-grandmother was named Ivy. So, my mother merged those names into mine. My first name is Ivy, and my middle name, Sydney, C-Y-D-N-E-Y, sounds like it would be spelled with an S and an I, but it is spelled with a C and a Y. Then my last name, Sanilla, was also her last name. My mother gave me this last name because she lived with and was also raised by my great-grandparents. It's both a sacred honor and a blessing. Now, about my last name, Sania. It means watermelon in the Tiwa language. And Sydney, my great-grandfather's last name, was actually different. It originally was Sulu, S-U-L-U. However, my great-grandfather had worked really hard to grow watermelon. The community recognized that it was a difficult thing to accomplish, so he was given a new last name of Sanilla to acknowledge and highlight his work in cultivating watermelons. Now, my parents' names are, and starting with my father, Randolph Adams, and my mother's name is Madeline Sania. They had three kids, so I have one older half-brother and a full-blooded brother and sister, although now I only have two siblings. The reason is because my older brother, Branyan Claw Sr., passed recently. 
about 16 years ago, in 2003, in an automobile accident. He was in law enforcement and was a really good person, a protector of people and had a tender heart that was a tragic loss. So I now have two siblings, my brother Richie and my sister Iva. We grew up in a sparsely populated area with very little homes. And I would like to now also talk about some of the issues and challenges that I faced in school and in college. Now, when I was born, no one knew about deaf or deafness. Not realizing I was deaf, my parents talked to me like any parent would talk to their child, except I was not hearing any of it. This went on until I was about two years old. When I was two years old, it just so happened, (laughs) excuse me just a bit. Okay, when I was two years old, it just so happened I was outside with my mother and I was playing and it happened that my mom heard a noise from a car. They must have honked the horn or something. And she heard that. At the same time, she called out my name. Ivy, Ivy. I did not hear her or turn around. I kept on playing. She called at me again. I did not turn around. So she started to question what was wrong with me because I wouldn't turn around at her calls. Also, my dad had noticed that I would wad up tissue paper and put it in my ears. So they both started talking about the things that they were seeing and they decided to take me to the hospital. And that was Keem's Canyon Hospital. It's been there forever. It's an old hospital. The doctors there could not figure anything out. So they sent me to Flagstaff, Arizona to see a specialist, an audiologist who gave me an exam and then figured out that I was deaf, completely deaf. It was a big surprise to my parents. Now, my parents accepted me as I was and accepted my deaf identity. They were also very assertive and they started taking sign language classes and they started figuring out how they could start teaching me sign. And my first exposure to sign was when I was three years old. Thanks to my parents being very assertive and getting involved when I was young. So at three years old, I started going to school through Head Start. It wasn't my favorite. I struggled as I was the only deaf student in a mix of hearing students. At that time, there were no interpreters at all. My parents really worked the IEP for my rights, for special education, and all sorts of materials on deafness and deaf education, which would improve their awareness. So my parents worked through that And it was a rough first two years in Head Start. There was even a time when my teacher called me stupid. It doesn't make sense. I'm just deaf. But the teacher thought I was less intelligent because I didn't hear. My mom really challenged that notion. She knew I was intelligent and that it would show in due time and that things for me would be all right. Then on to kindergarten. I had a cool teacher by the name of Sue. Sue Jordan was her last name. No, it was Jording. And this was her sign name after her curly hair. She was also white. But Miss Sue Jording had learned some sign and was fluent in ASL and was friendly and helpful. She helped me make progress with my signing skills. She also championed my rights and she taught my hearing classmates to sign so it could facilitate my classroom and playground interactions with them and really level the playing field. That was work. Then in first grade, I had her again. Then in second grade, my parents had to make a decision there. Since there were no interpreters available, I would have to repeat my first grade again with Miss Jording. 
Instead, my parents found another school. Holbrook Community, about one hour and a half drive away from where we were at. But they had resources, interpreters, and deaf teachers, plus materials. Which also meant that from second grade to fifth grade, for those years, it was very challenging on my parents. They had to get me up at 4.30 in the morning and make sure that I was ready to get on the bus, the school bus, at 5 in the morning. Then, at about the halfway point, we would meet up with another bus, a bus from the Holbrook Community School District. I had to transfer buses by 6 a.m., so I'd arrive at school about 8 a.m., spend the day at school, then at 3 p.m., I would repeat the same trip back home, so I would get home around 5.30 p.m. or 6 p.m., which was a lot. Of course, I was tired and sleepy, but that was second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade, but I made it through those years. At that time, I also learned to lip read about hearing aids, how to use them, and signs. And I also taught classmates and people I interacted with there to sign. Now moving on to sixth grade. I was able to transfer to another school, and that was Jadito School. They provided interpreting services there, but that also meant the interpreters had to travel to get there. Plus, the interpreters there were in the middle of taking classes so they could work with me. So access to my education there was at best basic and a struggle and somewhat subpar. I got just the basics. Because it was so basic, I started not to care. I got tired of the lack of access and tolerating things. I also started questioning the whole purpose of education, which really means that I started getting into trouble little by little more and more. Yep, trouble. During 6th grade, 7th, and 8th, I got into so much trouble those years. I struggled and I didn't care about education. I must admit, I was a bit of a bad girl those years. Okay, that was 6th and 7th. Oh, right. I do remember the summer after 6th grade, I was able to go on a trip and I got to visit Washington, D.C. for the first time. We visited historical sites, and I do remember as we were out and about, there was an interpreter by the name of Emily. Emily encouraged me to visit Gallaudet University, and we did. That was my first time there. I remember we visited a building, the Edwards Building. Then I remember being a little worried. Somehow, I had thought the interpreter was leaving me there and that they were going to take off and go home. I had misunderstood. This can be your future, for you will live here forever. What a relief that was. That was sixth grade. Seventh grade was pretty uneventful. I played sports. I was in cross country and basketball. I was also involved with the yearbook, and I did that through 8th grade, graduated, and then for my ninth grade freshman year, that was at Hopi Junior Senior High School. Having so many different teachers was a change. Of course, I had throughout my years experience having different interpreters. There, I had deaf teachers working with deaf students. One of them was Navajo. And her name was Miss Jennifer Keshakai. She helped me with services and encouraged me to learn about and assert my educational rights. As for interpreters there, we had three. Miss Emily was one of them. So was Miss Kathy and a couple of others, too. Miss Jennifer really worked to help me along in my education with my literacy, my reading in English, but I still struggled at that point with a third or second grade reading level. Yet I really wanted to improve, and I was adamant. I knew I wanted to progress and that I'd have to work for my education. Also, in my freshman year, at the IEP meeting, and in planning my services with my parents, Miss Jennifer K. 
Kishakai, encouraged my parents and the team to look into a deaf school for me. The Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind, to be exact, ASDB. She spoke well of ASDB and was very encouraging about it, but my parents were more pragmatic, concerned, and hesitant. The reason is, as my mother tells me, I had visited ASDB when I was young, elementary school age. And back then, there were not too many deaf students at that time. There were actually more blind students than deaf students, and that overall, that was scary to me. It also meant I'd be alone a lot. My parents figured they would rethink it as I got older to see if I would decide to go there or not, and the special ed department offered to work with ASDB to help my parents with transportation so I could attend, but my mother turned it down. She was hesitant to send me away at elementary school age. I realized it was probably because she wanted me to learn indigenous culture first. That was really my mom's main concern. She may have thought that if I went to the school for the deaf, that I would be focused on deaf culture and that I would lose my indigenous or native culture and that I would identify differently or not as indigenous deaf. My mom decided to make the most of my being home and taught me traditional customs. That was one of the main reasons my parents kept me home my freshman year. Now on to my sophomore year. First semester again at the IEP meeting while reviewing my assessment levels, Ms. Kashakai pointed out my English levels and I must say about my math. I was pretty good at math, but I hated equations, but I was good at math. My reading and English was still a struggle though. And at that IEP, Ms. Jennifer pointed out that I should strive for higher education. And she encouraged me to be tough. She encouraged both me and my parents. Then at that IEP, she was able to express to my parents that the future, my future, if I go on to college, versus just staying at Hopi Junior Senior High School and graduating at 12th grade could be something else and that without college that I would stagnate at the level I was at. So she really encouraged them to have me attend ASDB then pursue college. My parents thought about it and decided to accept the possibility despite concerns. But then I started thinking about it too. Then I accepted and saw it as a path for my life. So I told my parents that I wanted to transfer to the school for the deaf, to ASDB, that I wanted to improve my education and move on to college. And my parents were very accepting of my decision. So I finished up that semester and also visited ASDB. And I remember it was around Thanksgiving. And I remember that I did enjoy that visit. I returned, got back into the groove, and not too long after my first visit, that first semester of my second year was over. It was now time to transfer to ASDB. Wow, I remember the exact date, January 13th, 2006, when I arrived. Still, wow, 2006, it's seared in my memory. I will never forget it. I had made it to ASDB, but I was just not used to things. I was feeling a bit overwhelmed as I had not been around other people who signed ASL. However, I was improving and learning and in my time there, I was able to pick up ASL and play sports. At Hopi High School, I participated in cross country and basketball. And at ASDB, I was in volleyball, basketball, track, but they did not have a cross-country team at ASDB. That was a huge miss. There was, however, a staff member that suggested I join cross-country at one of the local hearing high schools. But I was apprehensive about it, so I dropped that and I joined volleyball instead. The rest of my school years, junior and senior years, 
I interacted with the class body more and more, had fun, and picked up a lot of signs, and I saw that I easily improved my own English literacy skills. I felt like it was easy to improve by the time I was a senior, and in my senior year, I passed the math aim test. I was able to pass that and felt pretty good about it. When I graduated, I decided my English was not up to par and that I had to pick up my English skills in order to make it to college. So I stayed and went to a two-year postgraduate program for more tutoring. As I had noticed, I needed a little more improvement. After the two years, I was able to successfully pass my English, writing, and reading exams, along with science. Though a little weak, but I was still able to improve and pass. This allowed me to sit for testing, the PCC assessments, Pima Community College, their testing. Apparently, I just made the cut. I had gotten in. This meant I finished the program in the year 2010, which was also the year now on my high school diploma. But the truth is, I was really a part of the graduating class of 2008. Also, when I graduated back in 2008, I had received an award, a scholarship, and honors, which was nice, but not enough. So fast forward two more years and another scholarship and honors. However, at PCC, Pima Community College, it was not so easy. Things didn't go so well for me. It felt very challenging. Looking back, I feel it was sort of traumatic and it made me have flashbacks to when I had the Hearing School Mainstream Program interpreters. It did not make things any easier. There were a few deaf students at PCC, but the majority of the class was hearing, including the professors. Then I had that flashback to the inadequate interpreter experience with nitpicky deadlines for scheduling tutoring and the rest. That was a recurring struggle I was trying to cope with. I decided to give up. I couldn't study enough. I couldn't do well enough on my homework. I also had a job to keep up with. My mom encouraged me to leave my job so I could focus on my education and classes. So I did that and left my job. And I tried, but it was still tough. I kept failing. I failed one class twice, a math class. That was mostly because of a not so great math teacher that left me very frustrated and made the class extremely tough to navigate. Then for my English writing, I needed tutoring support, but the interpreter had their own limitations on how long or how many hours they could work, and I'd have to wait. It just wasn't easy. I couldn't get the support I needed. It was a rough three years, so I did just give up. I gave up. It was so rough, I decided to take a break, so I let counseling know that I was taking a gap year to settle and calm down from having to deal with constant barriers and challenges. There were just so many challenges, and one right after the other, along with a total lack of access. I couldn't make any headway, and I did decide to take that year off and rest a bit. Are we ready with the second interpreter? Excellent. So I took a one year hiatus. And then I was informed about the HKNC. Now that's the Helen Keller National Center. Before that, I'd like to back up just a little bit to junior year of high school. Because before that, we'd been wondering about my exact labels. Deafblind was a consideration, and we thought that it may have something to do with Usher's syndrome. I had also been struggling with my sugar levels and diabetes since about age 16. It was a constant struggle, and there was a lot of fear and paranoia, wondering if I had other medical concerns or if I didn't. 
So the HKNC obviously specialized in deafblind resources, which we thought may prove to be helpful. I flew to New York, which specifically the HKNC is located in Sandpoint, which is in Long Island. And we visited. I had a look around and met many people there. It seemed really cool. I learned a lot. And I learned about the spectrum from ASL all the way to pro tactile signing. I saw various machines for typing Braille, which was also really amazing. All told, I was there for about eight weeks, and then I had an evaluation. I considered extending my stay, but something fell off. I was not getting what I needed in order to improve my education and become fully independent. And it felt like the people at the HKNC didn't care about that. Now, my goal was to improve my written English skills. Unfortunately, it seems like all the folk at the HKNC wanted was to take advantage of the funding that I provided for them, and I really wasn't interested in that. I sat down with my case manager to discuss my thoughts, my goals, and some options moving forward. I wanted to travel to DC and tour Gallaudet University for their open house. Two other deafblind friends of mine went with me we took a test of some kind. A, um, uh, like an equivalence exam, I think. Anyway, as I toured the campus, I really liked everything that I saw there and I decided to go ahead and apply. Now, when I got back to New York, I discussed that decision with my case manager, who immediately told me no. He made it seem like it would be way too much trouble to apply because of the paperwork and the fees and everything that went into it. And that lack of support really discouraged me. I had one tech teacher that was named James, who saw me upset and asked what was wrong. So I opened up and told him all about my troubles. He encouraged me to go ahead and apply to Gallaudet. He told me that if I had any doubts, to just go ahead and ask questions, call the school. I felt much better after that. Eventually, the call was made and I asked about tuition and other things and was encouraged even more. So with all this new information, I went back to my case manager and I told him, look, I know you lied to me. Here is what I found out. Here are the facts. He tried to backpedal and bully me even more, but I'd had enough. And I went ahead and applied with James's help. So as I'm getting ready, packing up, making calls, and finishing all my paperwork, my case manager found out that James had been helping me, and he was angry. He claimed that it was illegal, which was nonsense. And uh, I sent the application for Gallaudet in May. Gallaudet then contacted me and waived a college placement test, which was awesome. So then all I had to do was wait for the acceptance letter. Around June, I received my acceptance letter and I was scheduled to start in the fall. I was thrilled and ready to be on my way. So I let my case manager know that I would be leaving and that was in 2014. When I got to Gallaudet, I struggled to participate. 
cross country and track were particularly difficult to get into freshman year. And doing both of those things while balancing my classes was a struggle as well. Cross country had early morning practices that were at six in the morning. And for that warm up at 6 a.m., we ran around Washington, D.C. at a time of the morning when it was really dark outside. My coach, Coach Moore, noticed that I wasn't improving in my skills. And as a deafblind person, I was really struggling. So the coach and I sat down we worked together and got creative. Um, we decided that I would wear a headlamp as I ran in the dark, and that helped a lot. I had to be very careful. My team supported me. They led me. And if I fell, which sometimes I did fall down, they were there to help me. So much. I eventually showed some improvement. Freshman year, my team was really there for me. Sophomore, junior, and senior there, senior year as well, anytime I needed support, they were there for me. And I think that I gave them back something as well because my advocacy for my deaf blindness taught them a lot. They learned how to work with deaf blind teammates and the coach improved in providing accommodations for accessibility. I was incredibly thankful for that coach who helped me immensely all through my years of cross country at Gallaudet. Track was much the same, though I did struggle with the team as a whole. Anyway, my classes freshman year were all for my major, which was teaching mathematics. I wanted to honor the memory of Mark Hall. He was my algebra teacher who passed away working with him made me want to become a math teacher. I had not yet decided if I wanted to teach middle school or high school level students. And at the time I was double majoring in education and mathematics, which was not easy. My sophomore year, a professor in the math department told me that I did not have what it took to major in mathematics. I was upset and decided to go ahead and pick a new field which was media design. From then on, I really started to be successful in school and I stayed with that major for the rest of my time in college. I was an A student. I was excelling in my classes as well as in cross country and in track. And I was a representative for the SAAC, which is the Student Academic advisory committee. I was part of that group for two years. I was a representative for women in track and cross country. And my responsibilities were to express any concerns or problems that we had and put them to the table for discussion. For example, we had an issue with the chemicals in the pool that had to be discussed and resolved. Also, I was a leader for women's cross country for two years and one year in track. I wasn't sure if I would be able to graduate on time because I had changed my major. And in May of 2018, I received an award for having a 3.76 GPA. All of my final grades were A's. I had worked so hard and faced so many challenges. I did receive one F in a math course. It was a higher level math course and had much more words than it did numbers, which was definitely not easy. I struggled my way through though. I was mostly an A student with a high GPA and I graduated with honors. I also got honors and scholarships for participating in track as well. 
I got home with the intention of taking a year off to rest a while. After everything that had happened to me, coming back from Washington, D.C. was a relief. I felt really overwhelmed. Some folks really don't care for simplicity, but after so much trauma, I really needed it. I had been physically pushed and I just needed to recover. So about that. <laughs> Six months before I graduated, I was hit by a car while out walking. And recovering from that accident was important. So my year off really served more than one purpose. I stayed with my family and helped care for my nieces and nephews. And after a while, I weighed my options, if I should go to graduate school or start working. I was searching for job opportunities. There was one job at Grand Canyon um, Hotel Cleaning. I called for an interview and they turned me down. It's not really clear up to now why they did that. The second job I looked into, I found listed online. It was an overnight job in a dorm for a school for the deaf and blind. I applied and was asked to interview. The job was in Tucson and seemed like an excellent idea. The area had plenty of resources. In the interview, I was incredibly upfront about my experiences at Gallaudet my accident, everything that I had gone through, all the challenges I had faced. I got into detail and let them know all about it. About two weeks later, three days before I was to start working, they called and they offered me the job. So I quickly packed and got ready to move here to Tucson. I alerted everyone that I would be starting a new job. It was a bit of a rush and moving was kind of a whirlwind. But when I started the job and started to settle in, it all felt very natural. The community, even though it was new, was incredibly welcoming. The job itself required staying awake all night, which was not easy for me to do. My sleeping schedule was tough and trying to sleep during the day was difficult too. But all in all, I love working with kids. It's incredibly rewarding. Thank you so much, Ivy. Wow, you are truly a role model. You are an amazing, indigenous, uh, deaf, blind, all these identities that you incorporate into yourself and walk with such integrity and, and grace. And you have such a beautiful essence and your spirit is amazing. I really wish we had more time, but you answered a lot of questions that I wanted to ask you in one. And uh, But for now, I want to go ahead and thank you so much, Ivy. We're out of the question part time, so we're going to go ahead and switch to a quick break here. So give us about two minutes to make some announcements, and we have just enough time to invite people in to ask you questions. So thank you. Let's give it up for Ivy. Woo! Thank you, Ivy, for that. And uh What's happening on Saturday? This Saturday, we have the beautiful Keith Sokola, legendary native uh, musician who will be blessing us in the concert series at three o'clock. We do the concert series every um, the third of the month. So um, we'd love you to join us. It's the same channel if you want to come through Zoom or any of our social media uh, at three o'clock if you can join us live. And then at the end, when he's finished, we're going to invite like we will uh, very soon everyone to come in and uh, ask questions or do comments. Uh, the next Wednesday, we've got the beautiful Corita Coffee, uh, who will be here same time, six o'clock on the 20th. These 
are all possible thanks to our sponsors making all our virtual events free. There's no cost. Uh, also, we all our events have ASL interpreters making access available for all. We started the 1st of April last year with the theme of Rising and Resilience 2021 as the beautiful Ivy was sharing about her journey and thriving and her amazing purpose of what she took us on. But all of these events are possible thanks to the Native American ad adva advi ad Advised Fund, uh, the New Mexico Arts, Westaf, and the Santa Fe Community Foundation. Also, these are possible because of our incredible uh, individual sponsors. So thank you for supporting us. If you want to know more, please, above my head is our website, indigenousways.org. And there you will find those artists that are coming up, more about uh, Ivy and uh, all the amazing things that we have been doing through this uh, circle. A lot of you know that we have been doing emergency relief runs to Black Mountain in uh, Arizona. Uh, it, we last week did our sixth run, dropping off emergency supplies, PPE, food, firewood, water. Uh, we will. We just did our COVID test today, and we've been negative after isolating. Uh, or, and so we will be going at the end of February, uh, taking supplies again up to Black Mountain, also to the McKinley and San Juan counties. Uh, if you want to know more, contact us, hello at indigenousways.org. If you know of people out in those areas in New Mexico and also um, where we're going in Arizona. Um, all of this is possible because of uh, your belief in what we're doing, whether that be in the Indigenous Ways virtual events where we are now or through uh, the Black Mountain Relief Run. If you are able to donate in this time, we know that there's so much difficulty out there, why we're doing a lot of the things we're doing um, and you're able to donate, the information is there on our website. Uh, also, we have PayPal and Venmo. Now, in saying that, it's this wonderful time that if you're in Zoom and you want to speak to Ivy, you might have something to say or a question for her. It's that time that uh, we encourage you to turn your cameras on when you find them. While you're doing that, I just want to go to our social media. Thank you, Ivy, for pushing uh, this and all your friends. We've had a lot of people in through social media. So while people are in Zoom turning on their cameras or finding where they are, I want to go to um, Jamie Immerman, who is in New York. I'm, uh, Jamie, Janie says, you, Ivy, are a power of example to never give up. Nerissa Bond, who is in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. in Virginia, she says, powerful woman, thank you for taking us on your amazing journey. She says, thank you, Ivy. And then also we have some um, Clarissa, Amy, I hope I'm saying that right, who is in Mesa, Arizona. She says, wow, Ivy, you are amazing. I am so proud of you. Little sis. So we're assuming that's your family. Okay, everybody, uh, let's go ahead and get started with uh, whoever wants to start. If I don't, if we don't hear from anybody, I'll call some names. If you want to join, please do. Anybody? Caleb Wolf. Okay, let's go ahead and start. Uh, Start with Missy, my sister Missy, our sister. Hi, hi there, Ivy. Uh, so good to hear your story and everything that you have done in your life. What an accomplished life and just how wonderful that you've been able to experience the richness of your culture and also the richness of, you know, also um, being able to communicate in deaf culture and and the braille and all that stuff it's just it's so empowering to see how somebody can 
just really make the most out of everything that they have in their life. And, and that's what I try to do too. And I, I find that, you know, it's sometimes, you know, it's just like you have to really, uh, I have to be in gratitude, you know, for everything that I have and, and focus on that, focus on everything that I have and everything that I have to work with. And then I can make my life beautiful in, in that way. And um, so it's, it's just really, it's really beautiful to hear your story and how you grew up in, in Hopi and your, how your mother really empowered you in your culture. And then it sounds like you got a lot of really good support and education along the way, but you really applied yourself you know, to everything that you were experiencing so that you could get the most out of it. And uh, it's very inspiring for me. So thank you for being here. And uh, I, I'm really, I'm really happy to see you and get to know you. Tasha's voice here. Thank you very much, Missy. And let's go on down the list. Samantha, would you like to say anything? Samantha Moore. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead with your comment. We met in high school, Ivy, and I didn't really have an opportunity to hear your story, your side of the story at that time. So I'm able to hear your story now, and I see all your growth. And I'm very curious, Ivy, to ask you, growing up, you learned traditional indigenous ways. Do you feel that along the way, you also learned deaf culture. And now that you see both the indigenous ways and you see deaf culture and you see those both extents together, uh, are you meeting more indigenous deaf tribal individuals? Are you meeting more deaf indigenous people is what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, so I was asking you a question. Do you meet more deaf indigenous people now after going through and finding your deafness later on or going to a deaf college later on? Did you find more of that experience? More deaf indigenous people? Um, I'm wondering, uh, Samantha, if uh, you have Ivy's uh, contact information, if you can ask her that question. Um, do you think that might be a good idea to ask her? Okay, that's cool. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I can do that. Judy. Okay, and let's see. Uh, Judy wants to say something. Yeah, let's change the spotlight real quick. Okay. Thank you, Samantha. I, I wanted to thank Ivy for your talk, and I'm amazed by your persistence and how you overcame obstacles and were able to have so many allies to help you along. And I was going to ask you what teaching is like, but I, I think we're running out of time, but I'd love to hear that sometime. All right, this is Tasha's voice. Thank you very much, Judy. And Autumn did want to say something. So Autumn, would you like to say something? Hi, can you see me all right? Yeah, can everybody see me? Am I clear? Yep, my signing's clear. Okay, perfect. All right, hello, my name is Autumn. My sign name is this. Hi, Ivy. I just wanted to tell you um, I've known you for a long time and it's been wonderful to see your story shared. 
Um, it just really inspired me. And just, I feel like you taught all of us how to approach deaf and blind people and that experience. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And Ivy saying, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Autumn. And uh, last question this evening is going to be to Madeline. Hey, Madeline, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks. So can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Madeline. Hi, I'm Ivy's mom. Yay! Yay! <laughs> I, I'm not an audio, I mean, um, um, video. Um, I'm not very tech savvy, but um, I'm a really proud mom of this girl. She's um, taught me so much. I I don't know what to say. She mm. just so awesome and um, I'm glad that she knows who she is, where she's from, her clan, her tribe. She's even participated in some of her ceremonial um, activities. And I, anyway, I just can't express how much I've learned from her and how proud of it I am of her. And I thank everybody who's been a part of her life, especially you, Autumn. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Madeline. Thank, thank, thank you, you Madeline. So much. What a great way to finish this evening mm -hmm. by having uh, Ivy's mother, Madeline, in. And as Ivy said, a lot of her journey as an empowered, tewa, Hopi uh, woman has been through the love of her parents. Yes. So thank you, Madeline, yes. for all that you have done. Thank you, Ivy, for the extraordinary, extraordinary journey of you showing us of how you have thrived, your extraordinary purpose as an empowered Indigenous woman and sharing a little a bit of that uh, with us this evening. Before I hand it over to Tash, I want to take the time to thank everyone who has come in through Zoom. For those of you who braved enough to turn on your cameras, thank you for being with us. Those who are behind the cameras, thank you. I want to give a shout out too to Madeline, figuring out the technology. You're here, <laughs> you're here, you're here. I also want to acknowledge, and this is because of Ivy and her post, your other amazing daughter, Iva. Uh, congratulations on your nursing uh, on, and what you have um, achieved. Um, so uh, two amazing children. I know you have more children, but uh, very honored uh, in that. If you are in our social media, thank you so much for blessing us with your synergy tonight. Aline, who is in our YouTube, has got all these stars. That's for you, Ivy all these stars and shining bright. And if you're watching the recording of this, thank you. This recording will be available in the next 24 hours in our Indigenous Ways with all the other 70 Indigenous presenters and artists that we have supported since April 1st. And with that, thank you, Tash. I'm just going to say really quick that I have so much respect for the Hopi tribe. I have so much respect for all the 19 different Pueblos. Uh, one of the groups of that is the Tiwa. So thank you all indigenous Pueblos of these lands. We have some of you here with us tonight. One of our board members is here tonight, uh, Sheila Martinez. She's the honorable judge from San Ildefonso Pueblo. There's our judge, Supreme Sheila. Justice. Supreme Court Justice. I'm so proud of Sheila. Mm -hmm. And our beautiful speaker for next week, Corita Coffey is here. Mm -hmm. She's the world's best ceramics professor from IAIA. She used to be the dean of that college too. Corita's a full blood Comanche man these Comanches let me tell you she's going to tell us some stories next week you all so everybody we want to thank you all for joining us tonight Sarah Young Bear Arletta which is Aya and the Chin 
all of you, we love you so much. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And we're going to keep this going. And um, um, Ivy, let's give it up for Ivy. She's an amazing role model for all of us. Ivy, you are a rock star. I love you. <laughs> we're so happy and honored to know you. We'd love to have you back on our show again in the future, Ivy. You did a fabulous, spectacular job. Thank you. Blessings. Everyone be safe, be well. We'll look forward to seeing you. Touch the earth, touch the earth, touch the earth.